you so much, Linnea. So I am Lily Benitez with Bladecraft Barber Academy, and joining us today is Linnea Roberts, uh, founder of Gingerbread Capital. And we are so excited and honored that uh, she would take the time to join us today for Zooming. And um, the purpose of it is for the month of October, we are actually going to be matching the donation that Gingerbread Capital made. Um, so to kind of go into a little bit more detail on that, uh, Linnea, I wanted to ask you, um, first of all, um, what made you create Gingerbread Capital and what's its purpose? Great. First of all, Lily, thank you. I'm so excited. Um, I think the unanticipated benefit of the grants that we did has been um, we anticipated meeting amazing founders. I am so grateful to be talking to you, um, you know, many months later and to see you still thriving in your business and, and killing it, um, both uh, in your business and on social media. So I know it's been really hard and uh, so I'm really happy to be here and just want to say a warm hello to all the entire Bladecraft family. And uh, so Gingerbread Capital, uh, so first of all, a lot of people ask about the name. So Ginger is actually my mom. And if you look at our website, you'll see a nice picture of her. And, uh, and bread is sort of that riff on the 1970s word, um, which meant money. So too many glasses of wine. And that's how we came up with the name. Uh, but I spent um, close to 30 years on Wall Street. Uh, I was always working with companies, and uh, I noticed after I retired that I had never written a check to a private company. And despite the fact that I worked in the technology industry and came across so many amazing startups and early stage companies, and I just had never thought about this asset class of investing in someone's business. And, uh, and so when I retired, um, I spent a couple months, um, you know, looking for my retirement activities. I didn't lose any weight, exercising at Soul Cycle five times a day. So <laughs> I decided I better get back to doing something else. And, uh, and so I looked at making investments. And my last job at Goldman Sachs before I retired was I was their champion for uh, gender, gender diversity, which meant I helped re recruit, retain, train, coach, and um, get women that came into the financial services industry promoted. And uh, I loved doing that. And it just dawned on me, I might as well, I always say, I have to put my pocketbook where my mouth is. And instead of just talking about the importance of supporting women, I was in the fortunate position to have had a long career and uh, have capital that I could actually invest. And um, little, uh, somewhat of a little known fact is that most women that have money, um, at least 75% of it sits in cash. Uh, so we are not known to be active investors, and I was definitely uh, one of those people that uh, just sort of went, was oblivious to the opportunities of investing in founders, and there's so many reasons to do it. So I started looking at investing. Uh, I started meeting uh, founders and then decided, well, why don't I, you know, really direct these efforts to women? And uh, so that was actually really important to me. And, um, and so I um, uh, spent um, a, you know, a year or two really trying to understand uh, the implication. Uh, so anyway, so I started making investments, started seeking out women founders. And this was right before the Me Too movement, right before um, it became a much better known uh, fact that women were um, largely underrepresented in the venture funding landscape. And so that was my real motivation, was to try and help complete the ecosystem. So there's plenty of women founders. So anyone that tells you there's not enough women founders, I can point to people like you. And um, I know that they are out there. Uh, there's actually not enough women decision makers who are writing writing checks. And so that's really what we aim to fix. Wow. So I am 
writing down so many questions because I am so excited. So first of all, you've also been a woman in a predominantly male dominated industry as I've been in barbering because majority in barbering it's males. And a question that I wanted to ask you was something that I had happened to me recently. I shared that I was going to be doing my zoom with you and how do you respond to um, the comment the individual made was, it says women-led, women-led. That sounds really sexist to me. Yeah. At which point I, I, of course I didn't respond, but how do you handle that? So, because here you're telling me that 75% of the cat or the investment that women have is in cash. So you're liquid heavy. Yeah. It's rare. Yeah. Right. And so either we're saving it in our mattress or it's in our, or it's in our bra. We're the savers. <laughs> right. So it's saved somewhere. And yeah. so, but we have it liquid in, we have it and yeah. or women that do have it have 75% of it in cash and we're not investing it. So my first question is, how do you address the whole women-led is sexist? Yeah. Which, because being a woman, it, it's, that's not true. But so how do you address that? Well, first of all, let me just say, we are unapologetic about <laughs> our mission and our intent to, to support women founders and co-founders. Full stop. And um, so let me just give you a couple of important statistics. So when people think that this might be sexist in favor of women. So last year, 2019, there was $130 billion of venture capital put to work. Less than 3% of that money went to women founders. Less than 7% of that money went to women founders that have male co-founders. And so I think, you know, if someone wants to call it sexist, I will respect that view. But I think it's time to, as someone that is a woman, uh, we can help be champions for women founders who, for whatever reason, is not a lack of women founders. It's a lack of decision makers. The other, the other thing that I've seen is that when you have a woman decision maker looking at uh, investing in high growth businesses, um, we look at a lot of funds that are led by women. And just by virtue of the fact that you have a woman at the decision, decision making table for about 35 to 40% of their investments, even if they're not focused on women founders, happen to be with women. And it's a little bit like my own journey around our nation's discussion um, around uh, racism. Uh, I am incredibly lucky that my partner, who I hired a little over two years ago, um, is Black. And because of her, I meet many, many more Black women founders. And if you don't have women that are decision makers at the table with you, or um, one, you probably won't find women-led companies. So yeah. they come to us. So I'm totally unapologetic about the fact that we love backing women founders and co-founders. Now, I do think that women cannot change the landscape entirely on their own. I think people like myself need to get in the game and write checks. Um, I also think that men who maybe have struggled for all the right reasons, it's not, it's so rarely a, uh, a lack of desire. It's a lack of a strategy to go and find great women founders, to go and find diverse founders. And when you're taking in, when you're doing, you know, a dozen meetings a week with amazing founders, how are you going to create that extra space? And so the first thing I always say, you create it with your team, the team, uh, and having a diverse team means you're going to get a much more diverse deal flow. So, uh, so one, I, uh, I love what we do and, uh, I don't think anyone, you know, 
is apologetic about the fact that maybe all their portfolio companies um, are with men. And so I'm not going to be apologetic about the fact that all of our portfolio companies are uh, with men and women, um, but there's always a woman at the, at the front of the table. Awesome. Okay. So and I think too, the other part is being pro women doesn't mean you're against man. And I think that that's one of the things that, you know, it's like, because something's woman led doesn't mean that you're anti-man. Yeah. You know, so that's the part that, you know, I'm like, okay. For sure. Yeah. We, I would say that, um, you know, we have many great teams that are sole female founders. We have many great teams that are um, uh, two female, female founders. And we have amazing teams that are male, female um, co-founding teams. And, uh, and you, when you think about building a company, uh, you know, it's, uh, we, uh, we actually have a few companies that are all women. Uh, a lot of that tends to be the industry that they're in. Uh, but no, we're uh, definitely not anti-men. I'm married to one. Yeah. And, not, and I have one as a child. So <laughs> that would be very bad for me. <laughs> I'm a barber. I love men, you know, so it's like, <laughs> literally, I make lather and put towels on them and make them look their best. Um, so, and I'm absolutely passionate about it. So, okay. So back to talking about investments, 75% of it is women are holding it in cash. So where would you advise that they invest in initially if they never have? Yeah. So first of all, I think, uh, I think just educating oneself about, um, what is it I'm trying to accomplish financially in life? And, uh, you know, the interesting, so we're, we're actually, I'll put in a plug for one of our portfolio companies. We're an investor in a company called Elvest. And so if you, if you go to a wealth manager, um, a banker, and ask them where to invest, most of the algorithms that determine how you should invest were based on the lives of men. And so if I go to my Goldman Sachs person and they're going to, you know, they're going to say, okay, what's the risk profile? How much do you earn? How much money do you have? And the numbers that are going to spit out are going to be based on the life of a man. So Elvest, um, which was started by Sally Krawcheck, uh, was actually meant to attack that. And so on their platform, you can, you can invest the smallest amount of money possible. But th what they do is they provide you a roadmap and some training to go in and take a look at it. And um, I think as women, we sometimes think a little bit differently. Um, I don't go in and say, I want to buy this ETF, this stock, this. I go in and I say, okay, I have this amount of money. I want to take this much risk, but I know I'm going to need to buy a house 10 years down the road. How do I get that done? And so I think liberating yourself to think a little bit longer term yeah. and then also just knowing some of the ground rules of, you know, if you have a lot of money on credit cards, that's get a rid of it. Really high cost, you know, like you should do everything possible to get rid of it. How much, if I'm making X dollars a month, how much, you know, can I put away given my expenses? So the first part is just knowing what you have and what you, what you can save. And then the second part is knowing what's coming down the road. So women, for example, tend to have many more ups and downs in their career because we have children and many of us choose to take time off. And so, so I think just getting knowledgeable about it and, um, you know, pick up the, pick up the financial news or read it online, you know, just force yourself <laughs> one day a week. It's like, okay. And, you know, you gradually will get the, the lingo down and, uh, but there's no, it's never too late and it's never too early to um, improve your education around the financial markets. And uh, I, you know, I just, I'm a CNBC junkie and I just watch it all the time. And, and when I started my career on Wall Street, that was basically how I trained myself by watching television. <laughs> okay. Well, that's encouraging that yeah. there's still time and that it's never too late. Awesome. Okay, so that brings me to my next question. I found you 
during the desperation of being unable per state mandates to do what I absolutely love doing and what I've spent all of my passion and energy developing, which is creating Bladecraft Barber Academy. So we were unable to provide physical barbering services. And um, obviously we were on the lockdown for quarantine. And so during that time, I was doing a lot of research and finding what I could access in terms of help. So the question I wanted to ask you was, during that time, I found the COVID-19 relief that you created with iFund Women. And what prompted you to create something that was so specific and immediate? So for me, it's like, uh, my dad was a construction worker, and if he walked in the house, I, we just knew he wanted an ice-cold glass of water because he'd been working out in the Texas heat. You know what I mean? So if you handed him an ice-cold glass of water, he was just going to say, oh, thank you. So that's kind of what the – I mean, relief was such a great term for it because it was like, oh, at least there's hope. And for a small business like myself, the fact that – you know, you guys had 900 applicants and we were able to become one of the 25 that were chosen was kind of like, oh, this secret validation that I didn't know we needed, you know, because you're kind of floating around as an entrepreneur going, well, the lights are on and people are happy. So, you know, kind of keep going forward. So what made you create that? How did, and, and um, how did you decide how to best execute it? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. Well, first of all, I, I think like anybody like yourself and anybody listening to this, um, the early days of quarantine were so uncertain and very, very dark. And uh, to, um, to see that, um, you know, so many businesses were going to be incredibly challenged. And um, I don't know, it just started as this little idea, like we need to do something. And we obviously were big fans of investing, but then it came down to, okay, what's going to be the highest return? And I don't look at return as being only financial, but the emotional return for me and my team. And I think when maybe I'm not that business owner that has to get shut down, um, you need to feel like you're doing something that is not just helping someone, but enabling someone to keep doing what it is that they love. So I don't believe in, I always say like, you, you can't help those that don't help themselves. Absolutely. And so let's really find those women that, um, you know, are at a point in their lives where they have a business, it's of a certain size, and this could make a big difference. So we had to go through a lot of what I would say kind of the team discussion. So one, I'm benefited by having a team that was incredibly thoughtful around this. So we all, you know, we were on the phone uh, or on Zoom constantly talking about like what was important here. Um, how many grants should we give? Is $10,000 for a business, is that meaningful? And then how do we size it? And then I think to your point, um, executing, the execution was incredibly important because there also was this swirl of concern that people were going to get taken advantage of. Was this real? And so that's when we knew the team at iFundWomen. And I, and so, you know, we were just adamant that we needed to do this with a partner that could help us do it the right way. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it was, um, it was extraordinary because we um, got to um, meet so many amazing founders through this process. Uh, but I think it was um, something that was a, an important step, a little bit of a deviation from what we typically do, but yet something that um, our team could hold their heads high and say, we're doing something that matters for a group of 25 women founders and co-founders. 
And the piece I didn't expect was these amazing videos that we got, you know, from you and your team. And I remember you were standing outside of Bladecraft, uh, you know, with this amazing video. Uh, and, uh, and so that to me was, um, you know, just, I, I always say you should always try and punch above your weight. And so like it was so much more than the actual dollars um, themselves. And, um, you know, just, um, you know, again, every woman that received a grant, there were so many that didn't receive grants that I know just watching their, their videos and looking at their submissions that, you know, they figured it out. But um, every, every woman that we looked at to receive a grant was just so incredibly deserving that there was just no question. So Lily, I, you know, it is validation for you, but let me just say you were always a front runner. <laughs> you never even made it close to the cut line. <laughs> Um, and part of it was like, um, it's what you do and how you do it and your commitment, uh, to this business, but also to your clientele and to training people to do something that means a lot to everybody. It's super powerful. It's kind of like what you were saying. You couldn't imagine the results, you know, or it's, I had, I had a vision for a school, but the interactions I, and the relationships is just something I could have never dreamed of how powerful and positive and fulfilling it is. So you go out to do something that ends up, you know, you go out to do something that, I mean, it's helping other people, but really it just fills your soul on a daily basis. Trust me, our team got more out of this <laughs> than any of our grantees. So for sure. Well, we, we can't thank you enough. Um, okay, so bef I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask was, um, why is it important to invest in local and minority-owned businesses? So especially because you're looking at data, why do you feel that that's important to do? Because obviously, you don't just feel that way. You're, you put your money where your mouth is and you took direct action to help during that season. So why do you believe that that's Yeah. Worth well, it? first of all, I mean, local, local businesses are the bedrock of our economy. And anybody that, <laughs> that doesn't understand that, it is, yes, there's some very large companies and we can have the debate of you know, local versus big box stores. But at the end of the day, like we all love our neighborhood diner. We all love, um, you know, the person that cuts our hair. Um, and uh, that is just the foundation upon which our country was built is the ability to um, start a business, to run a business, and to employ people, to provide jobs for people. So one that's just always been front and center for us. And then on the diversity front, um, uh, you know, our country's demographics are constantly changing. And um, I completely understand the extreme privilege that I have had in life. I have an educated mother who insisted that I go to college. Um, so I, I, I grew up never having to worry about food security. And even though it wasn't easy, I worked the whole time and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, there's so many people where the deck is just not stacked in their favor. And, um, I'm also, I do a lot of work in education, especially in our underprivileged communities. And so I see it starts at a very, very early age. And so when I meet a founder who's a diverse founder that maybe, you know, um, didn't have, you know, a fraction of the benefits that I had growing up that has started a business that is doing this, I think, I, I just think there's no better thing to do than to support them. We had, um, you know, one of your fellow grantees, um, uh, I remember her telling me, you know, she 
started her business with a mop and a bucket and she runs you know pretty sizable cleaning service in southern california and she's like i didn't know capital was available and so for her this was just eye-opening she's like this has opened up a whole new world and uh and as i think anyone that started a business or given someone that first all you need is that little spark and you know whether it's a young person and they have a teacher that believes in them it's your first job and you have a boss that believes in you you're a boss and you have an employee that you know just does amazing things and gets to that next level all of those things are so incredibly important and rewarding and helping those people to double down on those few good things that they're doing is, um, I just think it's one of the best things you can do in life. And, and I, um, we were, um, I always, we were during the time of COVID, I was teaching, I was doing a guest lecture for a business school class. And I think sometimes it can feel very overwhelming. It's like, oh, how will I ever make a difference? This problem is too big. And so um, my, um, uh, a friend of mine, <laughs> Uh, gave me this analogy. He said, if you ever think one thing or one small thing can't make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito in your room. Yeah. And <laughs> it was just like, you're right. You know, just one small act and think about the ripple effect that it might have. Um, you know, uh, when we make a grant, um, we hopefully help someone to keep people in their jobs and it hasn't been easy you know uh, you know i know many of our businesses have had to furlough people it has been really really hard and uh and so i just think there's there's no better way to uh you know feel one feel good about um the many gifts that um we've received in life um but also to just be that one little piece of help, that little spark. And then I get to do this and talk to them months later. <laughs> I'm, I'm and they're so, still there. <laughs> so excited. I'm so ready for the world to feel better so that we can all hug yeah. and see each other again. Yeah. Um, and we just thank you so much again I'll, for I'll the opportunity. Be, I'll be coming to Texas for sure. <laughs> hey, we are ready for you. We got a big old hug ready for you. Better be ready. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. Um, so the last question I would like to ask you was how do you analyze if a risk is worth it? Mm, yeah. Um, well, I think it depends on what, what it is we're analyzing. So, so soul cycle is a very, I went to soul cycle one time and <laughs> getting on the bike was risky. <laughs> that was intense so that kudos for you for going back yeah well i i'm known to be a bit of an uh, exercise junkie um but uh yeah no um so i think i think risk is all about pricing risk and um but at the end of the day um there's a couple of things we really look at number numbers one two and three are founder 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 who are they? What do they do? Why are they doing it? And when the you know what hits the fan, are they going to run or are they going to double down and say, okay, you know, I'm not sure I got this, but I'm going to, I'm going to really try. And that's the one question that I've started asking myself more and more, because we've learned a ton about how our founders have responded to incredibly challenging positions. And so I sort of equate it with, getting married. <laughs> and so, and I've, I'm, I'm now on my second marriage. So I've, I, I actually know something. <laughs> I've done this twice is that, um, it's one thing to ask yourself, like, what do you love about something? But when you're selecting a spouse, a partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, wh whatever it is, um, is this the person that you can work through something really, really challenging with? Like, will they be on your team or will they be on the other side of the net? And that to me has become just a very fundamental gut check uh, that I do. And um, 
And so, you know, we, we look very heavily at the founder and then we also look at why is it that they're doing this because that passion and commitment um, is um, real value. And so when I talk about pricing risk, it's like, okay, there are risks in every business. Absolutely. And nobody really knows. You write a check to an early stage company. If you think you know, um, you, the, the only thing you don't know is it won't be what they told you because <laughs> <laughs> that's impossible. So understanding that you're not evaluating they said they're going to do X and they're going to do X. We get to do that with later stage companies, but early stage companies, they said they're going to do X. Okay. How are they going to do it? And this, and what are the risks? And so I think an important thing is just knowing, okay, these are the risks and these are the risks we're accepting in our lives. Okay. So I lied to you. I have one more question. What is an early stage company? Early stage company. Well, it could be anything. Everyone's got their own definition, but right? for us, an early stage company um, is a company that is still um, not typically not profitable or just getting profitable. Now, some companies um, are slow, you know are chasing kind of hyper growth, and they may, may be profitable at day one because they don't want to raise outside money and have a bunch of investors telling them what to do. Stay small. Way. Totally respect that, and I think that that is a really important part of our economy. But in our business, we tend to look at companies that are taking venture funding, and they usually are, you know, under a hundred million dollars in revenues. In most cases, under twenty million dollars in revenues, still growing pretty quickly. You know, more than fifty percent a year. And, um, and in a lot of cases, still in the investment part of their life cycle. So they're investing in their growth, not profitable today. Keep but growing. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, that was for my nerd brain. I appreciate okay. it. We love nerd questions. <laughs> well, I thank you so much for your time, Linnea. Again, mm -hmm. um, Bladecraft Barber Academy, we thank you so much for um, you guys investing in us and allowing us to be here to fight another day. And hopefully we'll be able to continue to be here for years to follow. Well, I'm just going to put in a plug for um, anybody that is thinking about matching uh, our grant. Um, I'm a huge advocate for what you're doing. And uh, this is, um, this is uh, uh, a, uh, an investment in Bladecraft is going to return in so many different ways. So I would just encourage anyone to do that. Thank you so much, Linnea. Thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a